the Christian life, some have said, is not difficult. It is impossible. Let me say that again. The Christian life is not difficult. It is impossible. We try, we fail. We fight, we lose. We get fired up only to fizzle out. Our faith is renewed only for doubt to set in. We rededicate only to sin once again. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit's power in our life. Why is the Holy Spirit so vital to the Christian? What makes Him so necessary? Apart from the Holy Spirit in our life, we are powerless, we are pathetic, we are pitiful, we are lifeless, we are listless, we are dull, we are dreary, and we are sad without the power of the Spirit in our life. John 15, verse 5, in, in the great uh, intercessory prayer that the Lord actually prayed, the Lord's Prayer, he says this, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, that's kind of disturbing on the one hand. But it's kind of intriguing on the other hand because in that same context, at least four times, he says this about the Holy Spirit. Your Bible may say he's the comforter. Your Bible may say he's the advocate. My translation calls him the helper. Four times in that passage where he says, apart from me, you can do nothing, he says this. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And then finally in chapter 16, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. He is our Helper. He is our ever-present help in time of need. We are so unfamiliar with him. He is the neglected person of the Trinity we're all about the Father, and we're all about the Son, and rightly so. But we are sadly lacking, not only in knowledge, but in experience with the Spirit. We have seen so far in our quest for revival that we need steadfast prayer. We need a renewed heart. We need a fresh move of the Spirit. We need for God to return to us us the joy of his salvation we need God's righteousness and we need God's direct intervention in our life and in our church and so this morning we're going to turn back to that thought about the spirit God spoke through the prophet Zechariah and I think it's appropriate for us this morning as we think about what we do in church and our responsibilities and lessons that we teach and sermons that we preach and songs we sing and committees that we serve on and everything that we do for the Lord, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We can do all of those things, and we can get by, but it's much better to do them with the power of the spirit. Amen? So as you have your Bible this morning, as you're turning to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, God's letter to the church at Ephesus. Chapter 5, as you're turning there, let me just describe this book to you. If I was teaching this book, the first thing that I would tell you is this. You can divide the book of Ephesians exactly in half. 
1 through 3, God is telling us through the Apostle Paul about some wonderful doctrines telling us about the spirit that seals us, telling us about election, predestination, the foreknowledge of God, the fact that he has broken down the middle wall of partition, all of those things, first three chapters. The last three chapters, chapters four through six, he's telling us not about doctrine. He's telling us how to put that stuff into practice. He's telling us what to do with what we learned in chapters one through three. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 14, which is not where we're going to be, uh, but it prefaces it. Uh, chapter 5, 1 through 14, describes what it means to experience the new life in Christ. Cha uh, chapter 5, verses 22 through 32, tells us what it looks like for Christ to be resident in your home, and in your relationships, and on your job, and all of those things. Where we're looking is verses 15 through 21 this morning. It's describing what it means to live the Christian life consistently. I have preached this passage, I don't know, many times in my ministry, but I have never approached it from this way. What would it look like? If every member of Southside Baptist Church was filled with the Spirit, what would that look like? I can tell you what that would look like. We would have to bring chairs out this morning. If every member of Southside Baptist Church was filled with the Spirit, we would not have enough seats to contain the people. We wouldn't care how long we went this morning. Amen. We wouldn't care how long Barb sang. And we wouldn't care how long the preacher preached. What we would know is that God has spoken. And that's what we would be about. Amen. And so as I'm looking at this passage. And we're going to read that little section in just a second. But we're really thinking of just one verse, and that's verse 18 this morning. And so what I am thinking is revival is living under the continual control of the Spirit. Revival is living under the continual control of the Spirit. Now, as a Baptist and as an evangelical conservative Baptist, that may be foreign to our mindset because when we think of revival, we think of all sorts of other things. But what we're thinking about this morning is simply this. Revival is living under the continual control of the Spirit. So let me give you four facts this morning relating to that. So you're there in verse 15 of chapter 5. Pay careful attention, then, to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the will, Lord's will is, and don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit." speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. There's five things in that little paragraph that the Lord is commanding us to do. They are imperatives. They're not suggestions. He's not asking us to take a vote and figure out if we want to do this or not. He is telling us, this is my requirement of you. Here they are. The first one is that little phrase, which is one word. It's an imperative verb. Pay careful attention. The second one is don't be foolish. The third one is understand. The fourth one is don't get drunk. And the fifth one is be filled. So 
Those are the things that God is telling us this morning. This is what I'm requiring of you today as we look at this text. Specifically, pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. That's what he wants us to do. That's number one. Number two, what he wants us to do, don't be foolish. Don't be a fool. Your Bible may say, don't be ignorant. What that means, <laughs> my, uh, I was always told don't say this word, but that's what this word means. Don't be stupid. Don't be foolish. Contrary, understand what the will of the Lord is. So don't be stupid. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Fourth, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living. Now, that's an imperative. That's good there. But he's primarily, first and foremost, he's not talking about wine and drinking and getting drunk, even though that's the illustration that he's using. But it is a command that's worth noting. But that's in parallel to simply be filled by the Spirit, whatever that means. That means a lot of things to a lot of people. That may mean a lot of things to a lot of people in this room today. It should mean only one thing, and that's what the Lord intends it to mean. So the first thing that we need to look at this morning, we need to know if the Lord is commanding us to be filled with the Spirit, we need to know what the filling of the Spirit is. How can we do and how can we accomplish Something the Lord requires us of us if we don't know what it is. So it involves at least four things. The first thing is this. Live with every conscious area of your life yielded to the Spirit's control. Every conscious area of your life given to the Lord's control. That's your church life. That's your family life. That's your school life. That's your athletic life. That's your academic life. That's every part of your life given over to the Spirit's control. He uses the illustration or the analogy of, of alcohol there in verse 18. Don't get drunk with wine. If someone was pulled over for being inebriated, uh, it might be reported that they were under the influence. Well, that's what he's talking about here when he talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit. That means that you are under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, you can take that analogy as far as you want to go because... In my lifetime, I've had to handle drunk people. And they're kind of hard to handle sometimes because they are totally overwhelmed by the alcohol that they've imbibed in. So we can take that and think about in terms of the Spirit. The Spirit overwhelming us in such a way that we are totally under the influence and controlled by Him. Verse 18 is also telling me that this is a command to obey... Therefore, this is something that I am not passive about. This is something that I am actively pursuing. Now, I know <laughs> that we're, we're going to talk about some Pentecostal and some charismatic stuff in just a second. And uh, sometimes that th throws us off a little, and I'll speak to that. But the filling of the Spirit is something that we are to actively pursue because he commands it in verse 18. Verse 18 also tells me uh, it's a present tense verb, which means that this is an ongoing, continuous condition of the Christian. It could read like this, but be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It could be said like this, be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. So living every conscious area of our life 
under the influence of the Spirit's control. Also, live with the Word of God permeating every area of our life. A parallel passage to this is Colossians 3. It lists a lot of the same things. It also has uh, what verse uh, Ephesians 5, 19 has, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Give me thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in fear. And then he goes on to describe all those relationships again in Colossians Colossians 3. But in Colossians 3, he doesn't say anything about being filled with the Spirit. The, the filling of the Spirit is the thing that drives these things here. But in Colossians 3, the thing that drives that is this. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So when I look at that, I can't help but think this. Letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly and being filled with the Spirit spirit are synonymous because they produce the exact same things. Being filled with the spirit means that we are constantly growing in our understanding of God's word, but I don't stop there. We are constantly growing in our understanding and our application of God's word. What good does it do just to hear God's word? And understand it if we're not practicing it so when we're growing in the spirit when we're filled in the spirit we're growing in our knowledge of the word and we're growing in our application of it we're also it also involves an ever deepening relationship with God through the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit my friend is a person he is not an it he's not a force. He's not a formula. He's not a magic wand that one waves. He is a relationship that one has. You have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It is ever deepening. And as it grows deeper, he begins to show you more things. And he begins to show you more things. And it grows ever deeper as we are filled constantly with the Spirit. It also includes unique times of God granting extraordinary power for service. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says... In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, that then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The coward Peter, just a few days before, was a coward. Now he stands up and he sticks his finger in the face of a nation and says, Y'all are all guilty of killing God. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. That happened in chapter 2 because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Two chapters later, chapter 4, verse 8, he and John were arrested for preaching in the name of Jesus. In chapter 4, uh, verse 8 of Acts, it says, uh, as they were questioning them, then Peter was filled with the Spirit, and he said, I don't care if you throw me in jail or not. I'm not going to quit pe preaching in the name of the Lord Jesus. It doesn't say anywhere in the text in between those chapters that he lost the Spirit. But it does say again there that he was filled with the Spirit. In that same chapter, they went back to the church to report to the church what had happened. When they reported to the church everything that had happened, you know what the text says? Acts 4.31, Then all of them were filled with the Spirit, and they went out and preached the gospel boldly. Filling of the Spirit. Special occasions where you just need a downpour of the Spirit. There have been times in my life where I have had to preach things that I wasn't really sure that I was going to be able to preach them. But somehow, God saw me through. There, are, there have been times in my life where I've had to do funerals where I have thought, because of the closeness of the person that I was doing the funeral of, 
there is no way that I will ever make it through this without the help of God. There have been stands that I have had to make where I have <laughs> known that there is no way that I can do this unless God helps me. It's quite exhilarating to know that God is with you in those occasions where you especially need him. We need to know what the filling of the Spirit is. Well, we also need to know what the filling of the Spirit is not. So let me speak to that just a second. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Uh, some terms that are used, that some people use them interchangeably. Some people on TV totally misappropriate them and do not define them biblically or correctly. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. A verse is talking about the baptism of the Spirit. It's not talking about that. It's a dry verse. It's not a wet verse. He's not talking about dunking in the tank. He says this, For we, that is Christians, for we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body. The baptism of the Spirit is simply this. The moment, the instant that you got saved, the moment that you gave your heart to Christ, the Spirit took you and He immersed you in Himself and He placed you within the body of Christ. He made you a member of the church, the body of believers that worships the Lord. He made you a part of that the instant you got saved. That only happens one time. It happens at the moment of salvation. It doesn't happen numerous times. The second one is this, Romans 8 and 9. 8 and 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, just like the baptism of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit is this. The moment you got saved, that instant, the Holy Spirit came to live within you. You got all of the Holy Spirit you are ever going to get. You, are, you got all of the Holy Spirit you are ever going to need. You didn't get partial filling. Uh, you, you got all of him on that day. It's never, those two things, baptism of the Spirit and the indwelling of the Spirit, those two things are never commanded. Because those are two things that you cannot do. Those are two things that God does for you, to you. He would not command you to do something that you are incapable of doing. He's the one that baptizes you in the Spirit. He's the one that comes and indwells you. That's what God does. On the other hand, the filling of the Spirit is commanded. So I'm still confused. I think there's some confusion with the word filling that we'll look at in just a second. But those things are never commanded. Some people think they are that it's a, it's a once-for-all experience that somehow elevates you to a higher place. A lot of charismatic literature, a lot of devotional literature, by the way, of people that we might like, they insinuate that this is this one-time experience that you might have, and then all of a sudden, temptations are a breeze. And man, you just, you living in victory because you're walking in the Spirit. And they imply that because you have the Spirit now, you're not going to have any problems. <laughs> no, no, no. We will wrestle with temptation and we will wrestle with our flesh until we breathe our very last breath. That is a false teaching out of the pit of hell. We are going to struggle. Life is hard, but God is good. 
Some teach that it's somehow because he uses the analogy of being drunk that somehow the filling of the Spirit is some kind of irrational, uh, emotional experience that we have absolutely no control over. You see things on TV like people rolling in the floor and barking. Experiencing uncontrollable laughter. Experiencing catatonic states. Slain in the Spirit. Speaking in tongues. All of those things. And we can talk about all of those things, but let me just say this. None of those things lead to godliness. None of them lead to godliness. What they lead to is a craving for more experience. But we don't, we don't live by experience. We live by faith. Right? So we know what the spirit, filling of the Spirit is. We know what it ain't. Well, we need to know how to experience the filling of the Spirit. So we have to understand some facts. This is only true of saved people. Only saved people can be filled people, indwelt people. It's an imperative. And I think sometimes the word filling throws us off because here's the logic. If, if the Spirit of God indwells me and I have all of him that he's ever going to give me, then how am I going to be filled with him? Because we can't help but get away from the thought of a glass and filling it with water. I thought you said, I have all of the spirit that I'm ever going to get. Yes, you do. The question is, does the spirit have all of you that he's ever going to have? That's the question. So, for our understanding's sake, it may be better for us to think about the filling of the Spirit as this. Let me read this. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be controlled by the Spirit. It may be better for us, in our thinking, to think of it in that way. Are you controlled by the Spirit living in? every conscious, giving every conscious area of your life and every moment to Him and giving control to Him. How do I do that? I'll give you some more in just a second, but here's how you do that. Every morning when you wake up, you pray a prayer like this. It doesn't have to be a long, flowery prayer. What you say is, Lord, take control of my life today. Every task I have to do, may you be in control of. Every difficulty I may face, may you have control of. Every temptation that may come my way, would you have control? What you are asking is to be filled with the Spirit. You are asking God to control your life. So we have to understand those facts. We must recognize and acknowledge that we need the Spirit's help, right? We can't do this on our own. We will not seek the Spirit's control or power until we recognize that, in fact, we cannot do anything without Him. We sing the song, do we not? Without Him, I could do nothing. Well, that's true. We can do nothing. We must confess and forsake all sin and yield everything to God. When we allow sin in our life and we allow sin to control us, that is the antithesis of allowing the Spirit to control us. You take the treasure of the Holy Spirit within you and treat Him like trash. Romans 6.13, we must present ourselves to God as those alive from the dead and yield our minds and bodies to him as instruments of righteousness. We have to understand that we must walk by faith and not by feelings. Not by, now I'll be the first one to say, I, li I like to feel my religion. I, I, I like to know that there's something burning within. But that being said, uh, that's not what guides us. Faith is what guides us, not feeling. 
So we walk by faith. So walking implies repeated, moment-by-moment -moment reliance on the Holy Spirit. We need God's Word to dwell within us, as I said earlier. It needs to saturate our mind. We need to memorize it. We need to familiarize ourselves with it. What would happen if the Word of God was prohibited? What would you do then? What would you draw from then? Well, we've replaced it within us. They can never take that out of us. Right? We, if you do that, you'll develop a habit of holiness. In my experience as a pastor, I have, I have come across individuals, and they'll say something like this. Well, you know, I could never teach a class, or I could never pray out loud, or, I mean, the list is long there, right? I could never, I could never, I could never. When I was one year old, I could never run a 5K. But you know, I, I got up and I toddled a little bit and I fell on my face a time or two. But I kept getting up and I kept toddling. And then eventually, I took a step. And then eventually, I began to walk. And then eventually, I began to run. And then eventually, I began to do those things and not even think about them. It's the same thing with the Christian life. We, we, we limit what God can do in us. Last, we need to know how we can know that we are filled with the Spirit. Well, how do I know if I'm filled with the Spirit? First of all, it produces ever-deepening Christ-likeness. We are more like Jesus every single day. Steady, progressive growth. It's like, you know, have you ever tried to watch somebody grow? Uh, those of you that have children, have you ever tried to watch your children grow? That's impossible. It doesn't happen like that. But I know this. I, I can look at Jeremy and Heather and Jordan now, and I know this for sure. There's been a lot of growing going on. Because I know how it was when they were first here in this world, and I know how it is now. And I have seen growth. It's the same way with the Christian life. It's the same way in growing with Christ and being like Him. Are you more like Jesus today than you were when you first gave your life to Jesus? What does it mean to be like Jesus? We're talking about the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, by the way, not fruits of the Spirit. It's fruit. It's singular. It's one thing. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are those attributes that are characterized by your life. Are you more characterized by those things now than when you first were? I get tired when I hear people say stuff like this in Christian circles. Well, you know how he is. It's like, well, quit being that way. You're supposed to be like Jesus. Jesus. Growing like him every day. And so if we have that character, we're also going to have the conduct that goes along with it. If we have the, if, if that's what describes us, that's what we'll be doing too. We'll be doing things like Christ. Experiencing victory over deeds of the flesh. Re replacing uh, a life of sin with Christ-like service and love for others. It will result in heartfelt worship thankfulness to God, and good relationships all around us. How do I know that? Verse 19, speaking to one another in Psalms. And you ever thought about that? Speaking to one another in Psalms and hymns. He doesn't say singing there. He says speaking to one another in Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making music or melody with your heart to the Lord. That's a byproduct of being filled with the Spirit. Giving thanks always for everything 
to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of love. So revival is living under the continual control of the Spirit. So, are you filled, are you controlled with the Spirit? Would those closest around you agree with that? If the Spirit pulled out of your life, for one week, would you know it? Would you even miss him if he was gone? Would you even notice? God has called us to live a supernatural life of daily dependence on the Spirit. So let me ask this question, believer. What will it take for you to ask the Lord to control your life? That's really not that hard. All you have to do is ask. Ask Him to control in every area and in specific occasions where you need His help. Your can't is the Holy Spirit's can. Your lack is the Holy Spirit's surplus. And your poverty is the Holy Spirit's riches. I pray for you what Paul prayed for this church. You know what he prayed for this church? Ephesians 3 verse 16. I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the power in your inner being through the Spirit. That's what he prayed for this group of people. That's what I'm praying for you. That's what you need to ask God for yourself. Now you may be here this morning thinking, man, all this Spirit talk. Uh, I, I'm not a believer, or either I'm a believer, but that's so unfamiliar to me. How do I... How do I even experience that? <clears throat> well, let me ask this. This is a better question to start with. If, if you lack any experience at all with the Spirit, it's not, do I have the Spirit? The better question that you may want to ask yourself is, do I have Jesus? Romans 8, verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Him. You may have, be having difficulty with the Spirit because you've not done the first thing, which is to receive Jesus. Because if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't have the Spirit as we pray.